Right now is such a critical time in the mortgage business to get back to basics. Creating new opportunities in this market is vital and, and getting back to those tried and true things that we know we need to be doing is essential to being successful. Building a network of loyal referral partners, implementing the perfect loan process to ensure that you have a thrilled customer at the end of every loan, leveraging your past client database and nurturing it because that is the heart of relationship management. These are all things that are critical to your long-term success and building income. What's also critical is having some structure and accountability and having the guidance of a coach. Private one-on-one -on -one coaching paired with highly skilled mortgage coaches is the essence of the Performance Experts Performance Accelerator one-on-one -on -one coaching program. It's a 12-month program that starts with a 90-minute immersion session, and then twice a month, you will have one-hour coaching calls with your coach. The Complete Referral Partner Success System is also a part of this program. And if you want to learn more, go ahead and apply online and set up a free exploratory call with one of our coaches. The link can be found in the description of this podcast, or you can simply go to www.mortgagecoachingnow.com and then click on get a coach. Once again, www.mortgagecoachingnow.com and click on getting a coach. I hope you enjoy today's episode. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the 360 Experience. I am your host, Tim Brahim, and welcome to another episode of the show. Uh, today's guest um, is somebody who I'm really excited to spend some time with. Um, I'll tell the story once I have Gay Hendricks with me uh, about how I got acquainted with him so many years ago. But for the short version, Gay Hendricks is a psychologist. He is a uh, personal development guru. Uh, he's an author of several uh, best-selling books, including The Big Leap, which is a legendary book for us in the Leadership 360 coaching uh, curriculum. Um, he is the author of The Genius Zone, which is another terrific book of his. Um, and he's been featured in such films as Finding Joe, uh, the documentary on the great legendary anthropologist Joseph Campbell. Uh, I'm really looking forward to diving in deeply with Gay on the subject matter of personal development, limiting belief patterns, and how to really find your unique gifts and cultivate them and leverage them in your life. Um, as always, please make sure that you subscribe to this show so you can uh, receive notifications of future broadcasts that we have. You can find us on both Spotify, uh, YouTube, and on Apple podcasts. And without further ado, I welcome to the show no one other than Gay Hendricks. Well, hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the 360 Experience. And Gay Hendricks, it's so, so nice to have you. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with me today. Thanks a lot, Tim. I'm really happy to be here with you. So I'm going to take the listener for just a quick moment back through my memory lane as it relates to Gay Hendricks. So back in uh, about 2000, I was uh, really starting to do a lot of business, a lot of loan business up in the Ojai Valley. And for those of you that aren't familiar, it's about an hour and 15 minutes north of Los Angeles, a beautiful community. And I did this loan for Gay and Catherine Hendricks, uh, but I worked through their business manager, never had the pleasure of meeting them. But I remember the name and, you know, vividly, and, and it was a very, very enjoyable transaction. And fast forward like a decade later, and I'm sitting in the classroom getting my master's degree uh, in, in uh, spiritual psychology at the University of Santa Monica. And uh, we got assigned an amazing book, which was called Conscious Loving. And wow, like to this day, that's my favorite relationship book that I've ever read. You and your wife did such an amazing job with it. And, uh, and I was just like, wow, this is the same couple. That's so interestingly synchronistic. And then like five years later, I start my, my coaching company and, and one of my colleagues was going through the conscious leadership course with, uh, Diana Chapman, I believe it was. And, and then they introduced me to this book called the big leap written by Gay <laughs> Hendricks. And I'm like, this guy's following me. You're like this guys everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so thank you. And I, it's such an honor to have you. I want to dive right in. Cause I know our time is limited. Um, I want to talk about upper limit beliefs. They are uh, a central part of your book, the big leap. Um, and to me, like, this is like critical, stuff. I mean, we all have upper limit beliefs um, and they affect the way we experience life. So just give us in your words, Gay, what is an upper limit belief and why is it important for 
for us to really understand what, what they are in our consciousness? Yeah, a belief is a central operating system message that says what's available to you. And if you have a limiting belief that says, I don't deserve love, for example, which is a very common one people have, you can see how that limiting belief would make you create one unsatisfactory relationship after another. And you might even then blame it on the other people, not realizing that you're broadcasting a message that says, I don't deserve love. Same thing with uh, financial things. A lot of people walk around with limiting beliefs like, uh, I've always got to be in debt, or I can't ever have what I want, or, you know, limiting beliefs that affect their money transactions. And most of these things, Tim, are unconscious, you know, that we get them installed at an earlier age before we even learn to think for ourselves. And so, in fact, that's one of the ways that Katie and I, uh, we we call Kathleen Katie around the house, my wife. Uh, we're just celebrating our 43rd wedding anniversary, by the way. So, uh, congratulations. yeah, we're about to head off to Maui and do a little bit of celebrating. Um, and so Katie and I, when we first got together, we didn't have any money to speak of. I think Katie had about $300 and I was actually in debt at the time and had just had my American Express card repossessed. And so I uh, was, uh, you know, I made my living at the time as a teacher, professor, workshop leader and things like that. And so I'd been in Europe for six weeks and uh, I mean, six months and uh, basically forgot to make payments on a bunch of things. <laughs> anyway, I was a mess when I came back financially. And so one day, though, I had this realization that this conversation was going on in my head. And the conversation was, do we have enough money to get through to the end of the month? And I realized, my goodness, that's the same conversation I heard around me all the time growing up. Could I have just now recreated that in a whole new generation? And am I now acting out of that program? And so I told Katie about it, and that was a huge moment because I had this limiting belief of how life had to be with regard to money. I always had to be a dollar short and a day late or whatever that old saying is. And so that was a turning point moment for us where we suddenly sat down and took responsibility for how we wanted to create our lives money-wise. So. I'm going to just jump to the next question right there, but just to keep this flow going. So you've identified the limiting belief. How do you work with it from that point forward to create some behavioral change? And then I'll probably want to regress a minute in, in a second, and maybe give another example to the audience, but let's just go straight there. What did you do once you uncovered that to evoke behavioral change? The best thing you can do when you see and disrupt an old limiting belief like that is figure out how you want it to be instead of that limiting belief. In other words, insert a better belief system in there about what's possible. Like what Katie and I did, I remember this vividly. I remember I was on my exercise bike when I had this realization, that realization about, wow, this conversation about do we have enough money? That's exactly what I used to hear people yelling and screaming around about the house uh, when I was a little kid. And so, I ran in and talked to Katie about it. And I said what I, I, I just told you that uh, I had seen this pattern. And I said, what if we could just make up a whole new way we wanted it to be and then our, let our lives live into that? And she lit up because we'd only been together maybe, I guess, six months or something like that, or maybe a year at the time. And, you know, we were still having financial str struggles. And so we actually sat down and we created a new belief about how we wanted things to be. You might call it an affirmation. And the idea was, we always have plenty of money to do everything we really want to do. Mm. That became our mantra. See, that's a better belief than, oh, my God, do we have money enough to get through to the end of the month? <laughs> you know, yeah. that's a much better way of thinking, because then 
life becomes about possibility. You're not trying to avoid something. You're not trying to escape something. You're building something in the presence. And one thing I've found in life, Tim, it's incredibly important to have a good why underneath what you're doing. You know, that um, I, I remember hearing a story once from Steve Covey, uh, the late Steve Covey, Covey uh, that uh, a, a traveler came across, uh, was traveling in the Middle Ages and came up to a place on horseback where he could see a long string uh, of laborers taking big boulders from the river and carrying up to the top of a hill. And he couldn't see what was going on at the top of the hill. But he saw one laborer after another walking up with these big boulders. And some of them had a smile on their face. And some of them had a groan and a frown on their face. And he asked one of the people with carrying uh, one of the rocks with a frown, saying, what are you doing? And he said, can't you see I'm carrying a rock up a hill? And then he asked one of the people who was smiling and says, what are you doing? And he said, we're building a cathedral on top of that hill. You know, there was a why underneath his effort. And the other guy, the why, <laughs> you know, was missing there. And so in life, I think we get what we're really committed to getting. Unfortunately, a lot of people operate out of their old unconscious commitments, like an unconscious commitment to stay poor, like my parents, or an unconscious commitment to uh, lose all my money and not have any of it stick to me. And so there's all sorts of strange ways we can be about money and the good things of life. But it starts with getting an idea of what you want and what you're committed to. And so once we made that commitment, it didn't take us long at all. Uh, you know, money almost seemed to come out of nowhere. Like uh, Katie and I, after we made that commitment, a man came to one of our little seminars that had like six or eight people in it. And uh, he turned out to be a, a general or a colonel in the army who was in charge of all their drug and alcohol treatment programs. And so he really... Uh, oh, I know what it was. We were speaking to a little group at an addictions conference, and he came to that little uh, group meeting of about six or eight people. And so then uh, out of nowhere, about six weeks later, we get a letter from the U.S. Army that said, you know, basically, we would like you to do the following seminars uh, for the uh, drug and alcohol treatment counselors on this date, this date, this date sign here, you know, and but it was for more money at one time that we had ever had since we'd gotten together. And so we couldn't help but notice the relationship between changing our mantra, so to speak, and to a positive one, and then having that amazing, unexpected thing happen. It's interesting. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm connecting the dots on this beautiful example that you've provided to you know some of the other stuff that I've studied that's out there in terms of anything from manifestation to the synchronization of energy in the universe and the law of attraction, all of these different types of things. Dr. Joe Dispenza is somebody who I'm a big fan of, who who is very much in the family of, of this teaching. And what I've heard you say, just taking the listener one more time through a brief summary, is first is identifying the the subconscious thought pattern that's driving your behaviors and emitting the energy based upon those beliefs, emitting the energy out there and you're going to attract whatever it is that you're putting out. Right. So first identifying it, then reframing it into a, a new story. You know, there's a, there's a bumper sticker from university of Santa Monica that I used to have hanging in my kitchen that says, you don't have to believe everything that you think, you know? And to me, it's just like, that just summarizes it right there. So like if you're, or another one, you're foolish to not win in your own fantasies. Okay. So if you're making up a story, why not make up a better story? And then from there, what I'm hearing is that you're emitting a different energy. You're putting out a, a, a different message into the field of possibility, if you will. And the result of that is the universe, God, whatever you want to label it, is meeting you right there and saying, okay, great. Now here's what the new you gets in the equation. Um, what, what do you say to, cause there's, there's people that are going to be listening gay. Like I'm, 
I don't need to be sold on this. I've, I've had plenty of these types of mystical experiences as well that are tied into beliefs. But what do you say to the person like, Oh, that's just, you know, you just, you don't get what you think, you know, like I, I, I've, I've had other thoughts, you know, positive thoughts and I never get anywhere with these positive affirmations and all that kind of stuff. What, what would you say to that person? Well, if they are in a good mood and I'm in a good mood, (laughs) I'd say, Hey, if you keep arguing for your limitations, you get to keep them. Oh, Uh, oh, I love that. I love (laughs) that. I mean, it's really true, isn't it, that people keep proclaiming their limitations over and over again. Uh, in fact, Ron Holnick uh, from um, University of Santa Monica, Ron and Mary, uh, dear friends of ours, Katie and mine, he had a cartoon once. I wish I could get a copy if you if you see him, ask him to send it to me. But uh, there were these three uh homeless guys making signs about you know please give me money uh but one one of the signs the guy was making said something like i'm here because of society put me here and the other the next guy had a sign that says you know i'm a victim of alcoholism and racism and the third guy was writing a sign that says i got here through a succession of poor choices and uh (laughs) One of the other guys is saying, you're not going to make a nickel with that sign, son, Uh, you know, because taking responsibility for something is a very rare thing in our world, in our society, because every day you hear people arguing about who's the bigger victim. You know, like one political party says, you're doing it to us. And the other says, no, you're doing it to us. And they go around and nothing ever gets done for us here at home. And so um, it's a key thing in life. In fact, um, I've had many couples here for, for relationship counseling get mad at me when I broached the following idea to them. And then they come back six months later and tell me it saved their marriage. So it's a kind of a magic key in relationships. And here it is. All arguments between couples are a race to occupy the victim position. One person says, you're doing it to me. You know, if it weren't for you, I'd be a lot happier. And the other person says, hey, wait a minute. You're the one that's doing it to me. And pretty soon they're off and running. And I know I've been there, but there's only one cure for that. There's only one way out of the trap. And this is what people get mad at me for. I say the only way out is for you to take each take personal 100% responsibility for for creating this situation. (laughs) You know, people get freaked at that moment and say, well, wait a minute. Are you saying it's not his fault? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, and I'm saying, here's an opportunity to get out of the fault game, to get out of the blame game once and for mm-hmm. all. And there's a huge payoff for it, Tim. The payoff for getting out of the victim game and taking responsibility for your life is that's where creativity comes from. That's how nature works. If we cooperate with what's going on in us and bring it forth, we get to be in direct contact with the creative force of nature. But if we go around saying, oh, I don't deserve this, I can't, I can't do this, you know, kind of bent over in service to our old limitations, that's contrary to nature because energy is can't be destroyed or created. It's here to stay and it's how we channel our energy that's the key thing, whether we channel it in a free, clear way to serve our deepest wants and needs, or do we bottle it up and contain it and, you know, uh, try to squish it down in ourselves. Like I have uh, six or eight beautiful ancient 300-year-old oak trees on my property. I'm just looking out the window at one now. And it's the time of the year when they drop their acorns. That's the way nature has it designed. And you don't hear an oak tree going, oh, no, I'm losing my acorns again. Or what am I going to do without my acorns? Because it's participating in the flow of nature. And nature 
wants us to expand all the time and get free of our old limitations. The universe is in constant expansion. And if if we will give ourselves a little permission to expand with it rather than resisting it, all sorts of magical things begin to happen in our lives. Wow. That was really beautiful. Thank you. Um, such a inspiring information right now. You know, like the industry that I teach in is the mortgage industry. It's tough right now. I mean, rates at the time we're recording this have gone way, way up. A lot of people that are steeped in negativity. One of the reframes that I gave this group this morning that I was coaching was a group of about a hundred people. So I was like, you know, we could, we could be focused on the fact that it's tough right now. Now we're stuck in that positionality and that victim mindset, very closed, not expansive. I think most would agree both energetically and, and in a lot of other ways, or we could take a different approach, which is, you know, I'm figuring it out right now. Like I'm really figuring out how to be a really good business person. Um, and I'm curious, right? Isn't curiosity. Tell me about curiosity. It seems like, it seems like victim and curiosity are opposing forces in some way, right? Like, could you share a little bit about that? Yes. Well, genuine curiosity is a sacred element of human beings. And around here, we call it wonder, cultivating a wonder mindset rather than I think I know it all mindset. Just the constant state of wonder, because that's another front door to the creativity in the universe. Because the moment you begin to wonder about something, you come out of the zone of the known, what you know about a particular thing, but a moment of wonder, hmm, what about this? You know, like, I remember a colleague of mine, a psychiatrist friend of mine that had never been able to make a relationship work. And he was up in his 30s, getting toward 40, and he's getting a little panicky. And I remember, though, that this one moment of wonder changed everything for him. Instead of despairing, he just for a moment said, hmm, what needs to happen in my life for me to get the love I want and need? And just that moment of humble wonder, getting out of despair, getting out of anxiety into wonder, hmm, what needs to happen here? It was a singular 10-second moment for him, and it changed everything. Six months later, meets a fabulous woman. He's still married to her. Um, I, I talked to him actually last year, and you know, because I knew them when they were first together. And here they are years later, and it came from that one moment of wonder that I was privileged to be part of. Yeah, the privilege to be part of part is really beautiful too because it is so elegant to witness someone getting free isn't it like i mean oh. to me it's like one of the greatest it brings me to tears you know i go to i go to esalen a lot i'm sure you've, you're familiar with esalen and and you know we've the, taught there many times yes oh wow well, that i i missed it i would have loved to have seen one of your workshops there in one of the yurts or something it would have been great i uh i think the thing that's so amazing about esalen when i'm there is i just get to be a spectator to people getting free and to me it is just gorgeous you know um so the person let's regress for a second back to the person who's in victim one of the things that do you have any other wisdom for somebody like if somebody could be self-aware enough and listening to this conversation and say you know what that is me like i'm in positionality i'm i'm in a victim mindset quite a bit i'm closed i'm constricted um and they want to get out of it but it's it's like it could be really deeply rooted, right? Because it's how they get love, it's how they get attention, all these things. What you know, I know you can't answer it in five minutes, but what what wisdom or advice would you give to that person to help them? Well, it all starts with creating one positive thought about the very thing that you haven't been creating positive thoughts about. So if you come out if you have a limiting belief, like I can't ever have a satisfying amount of money in my life. Or you come out of a limiting belief like, I don't deserve love. And so you create relationships that are troubled all the time where you don't get the love you want and need. 
But the moment you wake up out of that, all you need to do is insert one positive beam of energy into the place that's been closed down. Like I created my new body 50 some years ago. Um, I weigh 180 pounds. I'm about six feet tall. So I look athletic. If you saw me walking down the street. Um, but believe it or not, I weighed more than 300 pounds wow. 50 some years ago when I was in my 20s. And one positive thought took that hundred and some pounds off of me. I mean, I had to do other things to follow it. But I had this one thought one day, I, I had an experience where I felt inside what I call pure consciousness, that background, steady state, always on 24 seven consciousness that's given to us as human beings. And I realized I never had really felt that before because I was so clouded up with all the things I was sad about or angry about or scared about that I hadn't <clears throat> I hadn't felt my way through all of those emotions to the place where I could actually feel that pure consciousness all the time. And so that moment changed everything because I created this one little thought. The thought was I commit to feeling that pure consciousness in every moment of my life. And from that moment on, everything started changing. I started eating a different way. I started for a year, I ate foods that fed that pure consciousness instead of fed my old fat body. And the first month, I lost 35 pounds. And that's where the upper limit problem came in, Tim, that I wrote about many years later, my first upper limit I didn't even have a word for it at the time, but after a month of pure eating fruits and vegetables and drinking water, which I never really drank up until then, drinking a lot of water, staying hydrated, I, I've lost all this weight and I was feeling blissful. And I was walking down the street in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I looked to my left and there was a family of four in an ice cream shop eating this gigantic ice cream creation. And I went in and I ordered one. And for 20 minutes, I was high as a kite from the sugar. But after that, I got the worst stomach ache of my life. And I was literally doubled over in the street and on the sidewalk. And upper limit, I didn't have a word for it. But I knew I had sabotaged my good feeling. I knew I'd gone unconscious and fallen into my old program. And that was a wake up moment because the next time I did it, I did it less. And the next time I did it, I did it less. So eventually I stopped sabotaging myself. Years later, I came up with this idea of calling it the upper limit problem because I realized that everybody has it. You know, it's not just me that had it. Most of us have some kind of a way we sabotage ourselves when things start going better. And that's what I started calling in the big leap, the upper limit problem. I get asked this question a lot of all the careers that you've had. And I've, I've had three first a owner of a mortgage company and, a, and an originator. Second was the creation of loan toolbox, an educational platform for loan originators. And third is my coaching company. The question I get asked is, you know, which one do you like the most? And the answer is a landslide L360. Um, I'm really blessed to be able to facilitate this program. We're about ready to go into our 11th year. And this is a program that just simply changes people's lives. And there's a long laundry list of top professionals in the industry that you probably know real well that have graduated from Leadership 360 Signature Program. I'm super excited to work intimately with the next group. We only take 12 people annually, and this is the only one-on-one -on -one coaching that I do, and we've begun the interview process. So if you feel that you're ready to take your business and your life to the next level and embark upon a one-year journey that includes an eight-day business and life planning retreat in Costa Rica, a four-day implementation retreat in Malibu, one-on-one -on -one in group coaching, every month for a full year, you should go to leadership360now.com and complete an application so we can reach out to you and start the interview process. Once again, that's leadership360now.com. 
and complete an application so we can we can begin to get to know you a little bit. But don't trust me. Um, in the show notes of this episode is a series of testimonials from the current group. Uh, I think you'll be impressed with what they have to say, and they're speaking firsthand from their experience. I hope you're enjoying today's episode and back to the 360 experience. Why do you think people, what's the reasoning that people get? Like, I see this gay in business a lot with people who get to, you know, 95, they're on the five yard line, you know, I mean, they're five yards away from crossing into the end zone where their goal is set to be. And then they just start sabotaging. Like, and, and what, what do you think the reasons are that everybody has this aspect of their, their personality? It's all based on fear and old programming. Like, for example, you would, I just read a thing about Brad Pitt yesterday where he was talking about his marriage of being like 17 years of hell. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's a strong program. And so, how does a guy <laughs> who's the best looking human being ever in the world <laughs> and he, you know, he's worth hundreds of millions of dollars? <clears throat> Where does he get the idea of, I think I'll create misery for myself for the next 17 years through a relationship? Where does that idea even come from? Well, it has to come from some ancient place in him because it's certainly not co coming from the real-time circumstances of his life. So in his particular case, somewhere a long time ago, he developed an old fear about, I'm fundamentally flawed. I don't deserve to have the good things of life. I promise you, if we hypnotized Brad today or engaged him in a conversation, we'd find him saying yes to that very quickly. And because I know I've worked with a thousand other folks like that, and, uh, and living near LA, I work a lot with entertainment people who come up to Ojai. And so, you know, I had another guy who was, this is an even better story, Tim, because I had a guy come over to my house who was sort of a neighbor of mine when we had our place over at the beach. And um, he called me up and he said he was having a panic attack. And so I invited him to come over. And so we were standing out on my balcony and it turned out, I mean, he was having a panic attack. You know, I could basically barely hold him down and he was bouncing all over the place. And the reason for the panic attack was he was going to go down to Hollywood the next day and have his handprints put in the famous Walk of Fame there. And it induced a panic attack based on this old fear that we uncovered while we were standing there of, I feel fundamentally flawed. Now I'm going to get my handprints next to whoever it was, John Wayne or somebody, and I'm there forever. And if they only knew me, they wouldn't even let me in the city limits. You know? And so you never know at any level of the game, you're going to have some kind of an upper limit problem come up. So <laughs> I think we're all they, saddled with that. We just have to get humbled enough to look into it in ourselves. And when the upper limit, just to clarify, when the upper limit problem comes up, seems to me that one of the one of the things that we haven't talked about is that like it's about slowing things down a little bit to where you can see it right like i mean if we're just flying through life and keeping ourselves busy all the time not hitting pause communing in nature meditating journaling contemplating slowing things down we're, we're not going to see these things but once you see the upper limit problem oh wow you know, why did I go on that ice cream binge, and put myself in a, in a, in a medical situation in the street. Um, then from there you work with it by reframing that belief, just like, just like the upper limit beliefs, right? It's just another belief structure that you're uncovering and then you've got to work through it in the same capacity. Is that right? Yes. Well, establishing a new kind of ground floor belief, you know, like, okay, I do deserve the good things of life, or I'm open for the good things of life. Um, or in my case, I'm open to feeling that pure consciousness feeling and doing whatever I need to get there. And so that was my new ground for belief. But you have to start acting on a new belief in order to put it into place. You know, just like the guy who came to me once and he said, I've had uh, I just put this out on Instagram this week, too, and a lot of people are commenting about it, that um, this 
fellow came to me and he basically messed up 15 or 20 relationships in a row between the time he was a teenager and the time he was up in his 30s when he came to me. And it was all based on early programming. And he hadn't seen it because he always blamed it on the woman. <laughs> it was their fault that they betrayed him or their fault that they left or their fault that they let him down or something like that. And suddenly one day he actually said, this is the greatest one liner I've ever heard in therapy. He said, I'm beginning to wonder if it has something to do with me. You know, after 20 different relationships fall apart. So sometimes our learning curve is not as fast as optimum. But the moment you begin to say, hmm, what does this have to me? How is my belief causing what's happening to me in my life. That's a magic moment when a human being does that. When you even ask that question, wow, I wonder if the way I am inside is what is creating my reality. Yeah, that's magic. <laughs> I remember an experiment at Stanford when I was a PhD student there way back 50 years ago. They had people looking through a tachistoscope, which is basically a fancy machine that flashes a picture at you for a 20th of a second or something. So you can't really tell what it is. You kind of have to guess at it. And it's a test of your unconscious because your unconscious will guess at something. And that tells you something about yourself. And here's the experiment. I'll give you the 30 second version. You bring a bunch of people in and you ask them to drink four or five glasses of water until they're really full of water. And then you put them, have them sit down until they all have to go to the bathroom. And then just before they go to the bathroom, they look through the tachistoscope and it flashes and they have to guess what it is. What it actually was, was a picture of a yellow lead pencil. Okay. That's what the actual picture was. But the people that were full of water guess things like it's a flowing river or it's the Amazon. Um, now, the next part of the experiment wow. was they had people not eat for eight hours until they were all hungry. And then they took them through and had, had them flash the thing. What do you think they saw the pencil as this time? A hot dog. <laughs> um, a hot dog and a banana. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, banana was number one. I think hot dog with mustard was down there, you know, like three or four. But based on how we are inside, programs what we see in the world as possibilities even. Because if you think it's a banana and it's really a lead pencil, you're a letdown. You're going to let yourself down in the calorie department when you try to eat the lead pencil. So in other words, we've got to really get into a spirit of, benign self-reflection and benign claiming of responsibility, not like blaming ourselves. Oh, there I go again. That doesn't work. That's just like blaming somebody else because then you're reinforcing your, your victim position in yourself. But what we have to start doing is celebrating the new aspect. So like I have people, I had a couple last week that I was working with back East and I had them, they were having so much trouble being angry at each other. I showed them how when you're angry at somebody, you're also sad and you're also scared. And so I asked them for a week to put themselves on a diet of not communicating from anger, but communicating with, I feel hurt right now, or I feel sad right now, or I feel scared right now. And so I had them write it out and actually draw a little picture of themselves and put it on their refrigerator and put it on their mirror because you have to keep strengthening these things, these new ideas. Otherwise they just uh, vaporize. I want to, I want to just repeat something you said that I don't want to take the chance that anybody missed. So blaming yourself is re cementing or re fortifying your position as a victim. That's so important. I mean, because it's tricky, right? Because like, I have often thought I take personal responsibility for my actions and then have come to realize and really looking at it in more depth that actually I'm being a victim 
because I blame myself excessively too much in circumstances. And then I'm angry about it later. I'm angry at the person later. So uh, super important point. I want to pivot if we can in the next you know 15 minutes to, and, and if, if we get done sooner, I have a third, third subject matter, but to the subject matter of your genius, you know, Gay, we've, um, we've been really trying to, over the last decade to help our clients uncover their genius in a, in a very profound way. Um, and we've had some great successes in that area. I personally feel like I have. Um, I'd like you to take us through this concept of, of uncovering your genius and why is it important and how does it even tie into your belief systems too, if, if, if it does? Well, when you begin to break through your upper limits, as I hope all of us are in the process of doing, then the next thing to focus on is what is the most important high quality thing that I can do in my life. And in my experience now, I've worked with um, a little over 20,000 individuals and about 4,500 couples and about 1,200 business executives at this point over the past 50 years. And one of the most important things is to uncover that natural, always on creative wellspring in ourselves. And it doesn't, like I say, it doesn't matter, like one of my old mentors, Abraham Maslow, said, it doesn't matter if it's a genius soup you're making for two people or a genius symphony you're writing for everybody in the audience. It's what excites you, what turns you on. And in my experience, the best thing that human beings can do is to find out what they most love to do. Find out what we most love to do and we're, we're uniquely suited to do. So when you go down into yourself and ask yourself, what do I love to do and what am I most uniquely suited to do? You're tapping on the door of the genius in yourself. You're, you're awakening your genius. And genius is important because in my experience now, 50 years of, of doing this, um, I have found that the most alive, happy people are those who are expressing their genius and at the same time doing what they love to do and making a contribution to other people at the same time. In other words, the people whose genius is touching other people and making their lives better, those folks get to feel a sublime kind of happiness mm -hmm. that is very, very rare in human life. Mm -hmm. And I feel very blessed that I've been able to tap into that and feel that for the past, you know, many decades, because I haven't feel like I've worked a day in my life since I figured that out. So, Okay. Thank you. Perfect tee up. I want to go a, a layer deeper. Um, sounds like, you know, the genius per your definition is very equivalent to Robinson's finding your elements, perhaps some of Campbell's finding your bliss. Um, maybe we'll go to Joe Campbell here in a minute if we have some time, cause I love him as much as you do. But before we do, like I'm sitting here listening, I'm like, all right, that sounds incredible. Like touching other people's lives, being in this sublime state where I'm in sync with who I really am and what I'm meant to be doing. What's the process? Is there a process that you could just kind of help us understand in terms of how to get there? Like, like how to uncover that? Is there any, any things to look out for any clues, you know, stuff like that? Well, here, ask what we call wonder questions. And I touched on one earlier, but here it is again. Hmm, what do I most love to do? See, like 40 years ago, I realized, okay, I work about nine hours a day. I'm only spending an hour of that nine hours doing what I most love to do. Mm -hmm. So what I set an intention for is to do more and more of what I most love to do. So. For everybody that's just getting started, start with that question. What do I love to do and how can I do more and more of it? Because it only took me a year or two to go from one hour a day to three hours a day. So I was doing a third of my time doing the things I most love to do. That felt good, but I wanted to bump it up to 50%. And then I went up to 70%. And then I set the intention by the end of the last century, by 1999, to have 
a life where 100% of my time was being spent doing my zone of genius, what I most love to do and what makes my biggest contribution to other people. That is the zone of genius. Uh, if you wanted to put it in one phrase, what you most love to do and what makes your biggest contribution, that's it. And when you can live in the sweet spot of that, to me, that's divine living. That's an inspired life. To get started, though, you have to start just wherever you are, and maybe you're only spending 10 minutes a day, but tomorrow you could spend 20 minutes a day. So increase the amount of time every day you're doing the things you most love to do. And that right there is a great place to start, even if you did nothing else, just maybe spending an extra. Well, here we start people with 10 minutes a day. So you you can find 10 minutes, I say to everybody, even if you're the CEO of Yada, yada, uh, company, you know, Fortune 50 company. And so the first thing we do when we get the head of a Fortune 50 company is have them sit down in a little room for 10 minutes and ask themselves, hmm, what do I most love to do? And then we have them take three easy breaths and then ask the question again, hmm, what do I most love to do? So that's a fundamental question. A second fundamental question is, of the things that I do, what make the biggest contribution to other people, to the quality of other people's lives? And so that's a second great question, because like I said, life is at its best when we're in our own genius and making a contribution at the same time. How important is it when you're going through the first part of that process of, hmm, you know, what do I, what do I love most? what do I love to do most or what I can't remember how you phrased it. I apologize, but you, you, you understand that first question. What if, what if the, this probably is a limiting belief that pops in of, yeah, but I can't make money at it. Yeah. Well, that, that was, <laughs> that's interesting that you should mention that Tim, because that was my first thought when I first figured out what I most love to do. I can even remember where I was sitting in Colorado at the time. Um, I, I decided to, to sit down on the floor where I do a lot of my best thinking. I sit down on a cushion and just kind of breathe and meditate and think. And my question was that, what do I most love to do? What do I above all love to do? And the thought came up that what I love to do better than anything is sit with groups of people, small groups or large groups, doesn't matter, talking about the most important things in life relationship, our health, all the things, you know, that that matter most in life, what matters most. And why that was important, Tim, was I was a university professor at the time. And although I was succeeding and writing books and getting promoted and all that kind of stuff, um, I still like three quarters of the courses were courses that I had to teach that wouldn't necessarily be things that I would choose to teach. But the state, you know, like they said, okay, all master's level counselors and therapists have to have a year of statistics, you know, and I said, why, you know, I can teach everybody what they need to know about statistics in a nice three hour workshop, you know, but uh, so I was always hassling back and forth with the powers that be about that kind of thing. As a matter of fact, when I uh, I took early retirement and decided to create my own institute, uh, I was giving a farewell speech and they were asking me what I was going to do next. And I said, well, I'm going to kind of create a kind of a university that doesn't exist yet. It's one that offers no or offers no degrees, has no grades um, and only focuses on the most important things that professionals need to know. What are the tools? What are the ethics? What are the intentions? See, you don't need, I shouldn't be saying this, but like University of Santa Monica is a great place because they teach all those things there. And that's why I say, I send a lot of people uh, down there and um, I, I say, well, you can get an education anywhere, but if you want to learn something, <laughs> you know, go to the University of Santa Monica because they have a chance of going down deeply into yourself where transformation actually takes place. I didn't get that 
in my master's degree or really in my doctorate, which is weird when you really think about it, you know, because you would think that those kind of experiences would be even deeper experiences than one would get, uh, you know, but anyway, that, that's one of my beefs. And one of the reasons I quit the academic world, um, I imagine there are plenty of universities now where you can really learn the really the valuable stuff. But uh, in those days, it was kind of hard to find. That was back before the University of Santa Monica and places like that existed. It's what I'm hearing you say is that that when there is you know, first, the precursor is you got to find what you love. And then from there, be open and curious as to how that could evolve and be cultivated into a career in maybe ways that you're not seeing because you're limited in your thought process around it. Yeah. yeah. Is that accurate? Uh, oh, I, I forgot to mention that little negative thought that came in right after I finally got clear. Wow. What I love better than anything else is, you know, it doesn't matter if it's six people or 600 people, as long as we're talking about the most important things in life. The first thought was in my head. I said, yeah, but I could never make a living doing that. And then I, I realized, wait a minute, that's my older brother's voice saying that. That's exactly what he would say, um, because he's off the other end of the scale from me as far as, uh, you know, kind of wanting to go inside and finding out inner things and that kind of thing. His his uh, his solution is another solution, but in, instead of spirituality, it involves actual spirits. Yeah, got it, got it, got it. <laughs> Bottle spirits. Got it, got it, got it. Yeah, okay. Well, yeah, those will numb you for sure. I mean, if that's the goal, it's it'll work. Um, <laughs> the, uh, yeah, you know, I'll tell you a quick story. So uh, tying it back to your buddy, Ron Holnick, you know, I was in the classroom at USM one, you know, one weekend afternoon and during group share, Ron addressed the whole class. And at the time I was not working, I was just going to school there and I was in a transition in my life and, uh, didn't know what I wanted to do next. And, and, uh, Ron posed the question, what is it that makes your heart sing? And when he asked that question, I don't know what it was, Gabe, but that like reverberated in my body. Like it really, it was a, a moment, you know? And I was like, wow, that's, that's a beautiful and big, question. You know, I sat with it for quite some time, a couple of months, and I realized three things. One is that I love to teach. Teaching is a passion of mine. And I love to teach on topics that, like you said, that are that are near and dear to me. So this type of content that we're talking about right now is extremely enjoyable to me to talk about this deeper type stuff. Uh, number two, I love to host people. Like I'm a really, like I'm a really good planner and I like to create experiences for people that exceed their expectations. It could be that bowl of soup for two that you mentioned, or it could be a retreat, you know, and anything in between. And number three is I love to travel. And I thought, all right, so what do I do with those three things? And that's when I came up with the idea to start doing retreats, um, in different parts of the world and created a whole new business out of it. But it didn't, my point is, is that it wasn't like he asked the question and five minutes later I had all the answers. It took some time and it took that continual, hmm, hmm, I mm. wonder. You know, that's such a beautiful phrase, hmm. You know, it, it just really is. is. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a very underutilized phrase or word. I don't know what it is, but but underutilized. Um, we've got three, four minutes. Um, I don't know that we can cover anything in that period of time, but I love, I just watched Finding Joe again. Mm. Um, you know, I used to listen to Bill Moyers and Joe Campbell back in the eighties when I was 20 years old doing the PBS series. And, uh, and, and then when I saw you in finding Joe, I was like, Oh, I can't wait to get to talk to Gay Hendricks. And it was so cool for him to be in this documentary, which if you haven't seen this documentary, folks that are listening, please go watch it. It's fantastic. Tell us about the hero's journey real quick. And maybe you could just at 50,000 feet summarize the impact that, that Joseph Campbell had on your, your thought process. Loan originators, are you looking to cultivate new referral partner relationships with realtors, accountants, financial planners, and insurance agents? You know the relationships, the ones that will significantly increase your leads and grow your business for the long term. Well, you need to check out the complete referral partner success system. It is a 10 level 
easy to follow process that includes over three hours of training videos and over 20 powerful scripts educating you on exactly what to say. And those scripts are provided to you in full transcripts. Learn how to nail the first meeting with a real estate agent. Learn how to cross sell every listing agent on every transaction. Discover how to stop selling and start connecting. For a limited time offer to podcast listeners only, get 50% off. Normally, the referral partner success system is $899. To podcast listeners, it's only $449.50. Use the link in the podcast description for more information to get your 50% off discount or go to www.performance-experts.com. Now back to the show. Well, it was incredibly useful to me because purely because of one book that was very life changing for me, his book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. I mean, read that book, everybody. That's a mind bogglingly useful book, because what it does is show you kind of the path you're on, you know, and shows you the kind of throughout history and and in every religious tradition, he kind of synthesizes all of that and shows you a new way of going through life that that there is a path, you know, that there is a way of bringing forth your genius, the way I would put it, or a way of, um, you know, going through all the gateways that there are in life that gets you to a good place and the mistakes that you're likely to make along the way. You know, that's very useful to have a roadmap to that territory. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And how to overcome those mistakes and to be the hero, to ultimately be the hero and slay the dragon in your own journey. I mean, we all, so many great Joseph Campbell quotes, you know, the cave that you fear to enter holds the treasures that you seek. And, you know, so, so many others as well. And it's like, we're all on this path for self-realization and moving higher in our in our experience and consciousness and vibration, as you defined at the beginning of this conversation, but we're all going to hit our own unique, you know, roadblocks along the way, and how we overcome them. And I think it's a beautiful summarization of just the last hour of us talking together. I mean, most of those are beliefs, and that are then sabotaging our experience of life. Um, you know, as I was listening to you there share about your your choices in your career you know i just hope that you understand there'll be a lot of people that will be listening to this and you're talking about i think the stuff that you love to talk about and you're going to be having an impact on a lot of people who listen and for that i'm super grateful for your time and 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 your beautiful energy my friend well thanks tim i appreciate you for mapping out your genius zone and acting out of it because it's very clear that you're in your genius zone with what you're doing and the world and I and lots of other people appreciate it. Thank you so much, Gay. I've never met, had the, the great pleasure of meeting your wife, although I've seen pictures of her on Instagram. You know, uh, please thank her for me for not only lending her husband us for an hour, but also for the amazing work that you did in your book, Conscious Loving. Again, for everybody listening, that's a, that's a great book to read for sure. Gay, thanks so much. It was really a pleasure, my friend. 